uh, an Illinois Railroad. All right. He is one of those people that does not obey the pricing law. So, for instance, he's supposed to put out a price that says, okay, if you want to go from Chicago to Springfield, that's 20 bucks. All right. You want to ship something, that's $10. He's supposed to do that. What they find out instead is that he's not. He's selectively charging people different amounts. All right. So some businesses get a 75% rebate. Many others don't get anything. All right. So they catch him in violation of Illinois state pricing laws and rebate laws. They fine him $1,000 for one case. Now, Mudd was not stupid. He realized that if he fought this and won, it would overturn every one of these laws in the United States because there was a lot of legal questions as to they were valid. Remember, this is the great age of private property. The government can't tell me what to do. So you have a sort of sense of, okay, you have a lot of people who would be very willing to back this kind of legal challenge. What Munn did is pretty typical of a lot of corporations into the early 20th century. He went around and convinced the other businesses in Illinois to help him fund a legal defense fund. Right? It's pretty standard into the 20th century. Now you'd think they'd be very happy to see a competitor get hit. In reality, a lot of them realize, dear God, if this law stands, we stand to lose millions in the next 20 years. All right? So he gets them to pony up 15 grand in a legal defense fund. All right. And he sues the state of Illinois, claiming that Illinois has no right to regulate his business, it's a violation of his property rights, and that they have overreached their constitutional bounds. State Supreme Court for Illinois rules for Illinois. So Munn appeals again. Federal District Court rules for Illinois. So Munn appeals to the Big Daddy, U.S. Supreme Court, in 1877. His position being, that this state has no right to tell me how to run my business, it's a violation of constitutional privilege. Well, Illinois' position is very simple. You do business in our state, therefore we have a right to regulate you. In addition, we have a right to protect consumers. And clearly, you are not doing anything to benefit consumers. You're defrauding them. Supreme Court rules 6 to 3, Illinois. Granger laws are legal and states have the right to regulate businesses within their borders. Ah, the key to that phrase is within borders. All right? Because after the Munn case, corporate lawyers began to pop up for a lot of these new corporations, especially railroads and places like Standard Oil and U.S. Steel. So they started asking their corporate <coughs> lawyers, okay, is there a way around this? Oh, yeah, there is. It's called the Interstate Commerce Clause. If you open up a business across state lines, state can't regulate you. You are controlled by the federal government. And at that point in history, there is no Interstate Commerce Regulatory Agency. So you'd literally be having complete carte blanche to do whatever you wanted, when you wanted, without fear of being prosecuted or investigated. There's almost no laws in the books on this. So, a lot of them do that. Now, they go and open up an office or a station right across the state line. Now, sometimes this never turns a profit. Sometimes it never even has customers. But as long as you have an office or a station, you are not technically covered by state law. However, many states saw that for what it was, an attempt to get around the only regulation that there was. So a lot of states, particularly Illinois, refused to recognize the interstate commerce exemption. Wabash Railroad operated in Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. So they claimed to the Illinois regulatory authorities, you can't regulate us, we're interstate. <coughs> Illinois said, nice try, you broke our pricing laws, you committed a crime, you're getting fined. All right? Wabash sues Illinois. Illinois wins the state Supreme Court case. So Wabash sues again. Wabash loses at the federal district court. Wabash sues and takes it federal. 5-4, Supreme Court rules for Wabash. They are covered by the interstate commerce exemption because they do business across state lines. Therefore, Granger laws have no application to any interstate business. This is literally a billion dollar loophole. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. 
Granger laws do not cover interstate commerce businesses. They can only cover state businesses. So something that goes in between like Chicago, or in Illinois and like... Wisconsin, Wisconsin. is interstate. Okay. So like Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia. So if it was like a railroad. Yeah, that covers too. Again, okay, it gets more interesting. Supreme Court rules 10 years later that interstate commerce regulation only applies to railroads not to any manufacturing concern, all right? They changed that loophole in 1905 by passing a new set of legislation. But before 1905 in this country, the only business legally regulated by the U.S. government is railroads. Yes, sir? Well, if you're going to move from Illinois to wherever, mm -hmm. why doesn't that other state take that business in Texas too? Uh, because anytime you do business across state lines, it's not state, it's federal. Interstate Commerce Clause states that Congress has the exclusive jurisdiction over business between the states. So if you do business between states, not in states, it's interstate, not interstate. <coughs> Alright? So for instance, this is why the federal government has the right to do the interstate highway system. Alright? So initially, here comes the complication. This is a billion dollar loophole. So all you got to do if you want to avoid being regulated by your state, again, anything. Because this applies to any business. Banking, oil, steel, anything, manufacturing. The loophole is huge. And it takes about 40 years, excuse me, 40 years for all of these businesses to get covered. All right? And remember, the first attention is on railroads. So they create this huge loophole. There are people who complain. And the very next year, you'll notice, Congress responds with a piece of legislation designed to deal with this issue. It's called the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. The ICC establishes the Interstate Commerce Commission, whose job it is is to enforce interstate regulation. However, as of 1887, their only jurisdiction is railroads. Now, by 1906, it's telephone and telegraph, all right? And then after 1910, it's any form of manufacturing in this country. And banking and their regulation is a separate piece of legislation by law, all right? But for most of the next 30 years, most American businesses are not covered under state commerce, uh, co commerce enforcement. Here's how the commission works. It's a disaster. In the 1880s, there were a lot of high-profile government scandals. And so, the 1880s, most of the presidents that appeared were Republicans. So what they did consistently was, in order to appease the reformers, they formed commissions. All right? The best way of describing these commissions is, you know Mayor Quimby from The Simpsons? He's always having some fact-finding mission, and he's always having some kind of investigation, and invariably doesn't do anything or fix anything, it's just a bigger disaster. Mm -hmm. Imagine this, but involving Congress. All right? 500 total idiots, all right? Here's how it works. They want to cater to people who are pissed off because they know they'll vote against their re-election, all right? And in many cases, the corruption is so immense and been so seriously exposed, let's be honest, you gotta do something because otherwise it's just hugely embarrassing. So they started creating these government commissions in the 1880s and one of them served as the model for everything else. I'm gonna show you how it worked so I can explain how this applied to the ICC. The commission that was first created to deal with issues of government corruption had nothing to do with business. It's the Civil Service Commission. Now after a disgruntled office seeker shot and killed President Garfield, the government decided to create a Civil Service Commission to handle government jobs and awards. All right. The problem was, as we talked about before, all government <clears throat> jobs are appointed. It was a key way of keeping party loyalty and party discipline by doling out jobs every few years. All right? So you have to have a civil service commission, but you give it no power. They're only allowed to actually give tests to 10% of all applicants, and they can't retroactively give anybody a test who's already got a job. All right? So they establish a commission whose job is not just to give tests, but also to investigate abuse or violations of the newly emerging civil service law. So for instance, you can't fire people without cause, all right? 
you can't hire someone who's related to a congressman or a government employee. All right? And they can't just get hired on the spot. They actually have to fill out an application. So again, it's basic, simple rules that we see in a lot of jobs to this day. All right? So here's how it works. Running this whole thing were three commissioners. Whose job it was was to oversee the agency. They made $2,000 a year. All right? And by the way, they're appointed. Now, the president traditionally appointed someone who was opposed to civil service reform to run the agency. The idea being that if the person's opposed to the job he's supposed to have, he won't enforce it. He'll just collect a paycheck and not do anything. All right? Below them are 22 employees. This includes secretaries, clerks, and investigators. And you will notice there are no attorneys. Nowadays, every government agency has got itself an attorney somewhere on file. Not back then. If you need an attorney, you have to request from the Attorney General's office, and they'll approve the request, usually within six months. So no surprise why very few of these things get prosecuted back then. All right. They receive 10,000 complaints a year. All right. They are responsible to give out 200,000 tests a year. Can they do their job? No. Alexander Hamilton said it best, the power to tax is the power to kill. If you want to make sure something flourishes, you give it money. If you want to make sure it sort of stagnates and dies, it's token, correct? It's the classic example of token government reform to keep people happy but not to change anything, all right? So they get 10,000 complaints a year. So let's say, for instance, a bunch of people got fired in Ohio illegally. So that the Secretary of State, this is a true story, so the Secretary of State's cousins in Ohio could get jobs in the Postal Service. That's illegal. You can't do that. How long before those complaints actually reach the agency? All right? They only investigate the most serious or the ones that have the most complaints, all right? So you get a complaint that comes in. It might take months to forward its way up, all right? You get it. The final authority on whether you investigate is your boss, the commissioner. He decides who goes and who stays, all right? So by the time he approves the investigation, six months have passed, all right? You take a train to Ohio. What are the chances somebody finds out what you're doing when you get there? Considering what you're doing and how high up this goes. All right. This happened to Teddy Roosevelt. He was trying to investigate this very same case, and no one would talk. All right. So what are the chances you get to Ohio and you can't find a complaining witness or nobody wants to talk? Pretty good, right? Now, if you do find somebody, you write a report. That report gets sent back to your boss, and he decides whether or not it goes to the Attorney General to prosecute. Chances you have an actual prosecution? Slim to none. Slim to none. All right. You have to request an Attorney General, an attorney from the Attorney General's office. You will get a new guy with no experience. All right. It will take up to three years for this to be formally heard as a hearing which by which time you may have switched administrations and the case might get dropped out right. All right. This is the model for this. The commission that's supposed to regulate and enforce railroads and their pricing statutes. In fact, the only thing they have the right to control now is railroads and their ability to enforce prices. All right. So we have three commissioners and 22 employees. They receive at first 15,000 complaints a year. 15,000. So we have the same thing. What if we find out the B&O Railroad